Hi, everybody. So hello and welcome to today's webinar with Ocean Networks Canada. So my name is Luisa Sarmiento and I will be your moderator today. We also have Tessa Owens who will help with the interactivity and the Zoom chat. And uh, just popped, we have uh, Dr. Kate Morin who will be our speaker today. So it's really nice to see so many people here. I'm really happy. Um, but first, uh, let me introduce the Ocean Networks Canada Summer Webinar Series, which is this. The aim of this series is to offer free online interactive events featuring ocean-related topics. This series introduces both scientific and indigenous approaches to understand ocean changes and their importance nowadays. So as you can see on the screen, there is still one live event left in two weeks. So make sure that you register for that uh, event using the same Zoom registration link that you used for today's event. So now uh, let's see how you can participate in today's event. So as you can see on the screen, you can participate using Mentimeter. So you simply have to go to menti.com and enter the following code, the one you can see uh, on the screen. So 967445. Um, and you can either use your smartphone, use a different browser tab, or you can also download the application Mentimeter. So if none of that is possible to you, don't worry. You can always put your answers in the Zoom chat um, or you can simply uh, watch. So um, now I'm gonna invite all of you to try that out and let's see uh, where are you partici participating from today. Okay, wow, a lot of answers already. That's really great. Um, so I see we have people from Victoria, from British Columbia, obviously, from Sydney, Sydney, BC, huh? Langford, BC, Los Angeles, also from Vancouver, from home, that's nice. Um, from Oceanography, that's also nice, I guess. And from Uklu, Ukluet, <laughs> Uklulet, I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Okay, um, so I guess uh, 19 of you fi have figured this out. Nice. Oh, we have from the Philippines. That's exciting. Great. So it must be evening or tomorrow already. Perfect. Okay, so um, we'll leave it like that. Nice to see all of you. I'm really happy to have so many people from different places. And um, Yes, so, um, so now I, I really, I'm really honored and I'm really happy to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Kate Morin. So um, uh, Kate is joined Ocean Networks Canada in 2011 as the CEO. From 2009 and 2011, she was appointed as Assistant Director at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She also co-led the first deep water drilling operation in the Arctic Ocean, recovering the first paleoclimate record from this region. Currently, she's still a professor at the University of Victoria and the University of Rhode Island. I'm really honored to give the floor to you, Kate. Thank you so much, uh, Louisa. Let me just uh, begin by sharing my screen. Share and play. Let me first, uh, by uh, recognizing and acknowledging and respect the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples on whose traditional territories the university stands and whose historical relationships continue to this day. And I hope all of you who, wherever you are, can also um, thank your host nations wherever you're located as we begin the presentation. Um, this is a this is a presentation about basics about climate change, but what we've learned from recent time and from deep time. So I'm just going to first. This is just a list of what I'm going to be talking about. A little bit about me, explaining the greenhouse effect, what causes climate to change. I'm going to talk a little bit about that drilling expedition that Louisa mentioned in the introduction, and then I'm going to talk about the three options we have in terms of our future climate mitigation, adaptation, and of course there's hopefully not too much suffering. This is a very busy slide. On, on the left, you'll see uh, the answers to my Proust questionnaires. I won't read them out 
loud to you, but you can actually just see some of the things about me by my answers to, to the uh, Proust questionnaire. And some of the things uh, I like to do, this is a picture of, first of me as a baby with my two sisters. I was the youngest in the photo. And some of the things I like to do, I like to hike, especially with my dogs, the poodles you see on the upper left. I have done a lot of backcountry skiing. This is a, the picture you see is from the Illisillowit Glacier. And uh, I love backcountry canoeing. So I'll start with the greenhouse effect, but let, let's, I'm going to turn it over to Louisa for um, a menti moment. Yes, so um, we'll get some interactivity already going. We're going to ask you yes or no. The four main greenhouse gases are. So you have different um, choices. You can go ahead and enter the Mentimeter code, the code 967445. And let's see. Okay, great. We have a lot of participants. Okay, it seems that uh, it's getting uh, averaged. <laughs> Let's wait a little bit more. Okay, so while we get some uh, more answers, uh, maybe Kate, you can start commenting on that already. Yeah, I think so, some of the some of the some of the folks out there have gotten a few of them quite correct. So we'll see that in a moment. Okay, so uh, let's turn it back to the presentation. Okay, so uh, I left it by um, talking about greenhouse gases, and so this is just an image showing you the fact that there's, there's gases in the atmosphere that actually uh, allow heat to come through the atmosphere, and there's gases that, that also leave, allow us to leave heat in the atmosphere. But there's greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere, and those greenhouse gases are special because they're loosely bonded atoms. And those loosely bonded, bonded, bonded atoms vibrate when they, uh, then when they absorb heat. And that vibration takes a long time to stop. And that's by, once the vibration stops, that, that heat is released. So the greenhouse gases don't keep the heat in the atmosphere forever, but they keep them for certain lengths of time based on how loosely bonded they are. And so there are the, the major ones that some of you got right, methane, of course, but it all has a short lifetime of vibration before it releases that heat, 12 years, about. And then, of course, there's nitrous oxide that you got right. That has a longer time period in the atmosphere. There's water vapor, but that just comes and goes. So that's a rapidly coming and going greenhouse gas. And of course, we all know carbon dioxide. What's important here is carbon dioxide has a long lifetime. So we, water vapor comes in and out, so we don't really think about that too much. Methane is a very powerful, the most powerful, but it's a short, short life, lifetime. Nitrous oxide is, is less powerful than methane and less powerful than carbon dioxide. So those are the greenhouse gases. Now, how do we know about the greenhouse effect? It started with physics. As physicist Langley in the eight, late 1800s calculated the surface temperature of the moon by measuring the in, incoming infrared radiation. And then other scientists, in this case Arrhenius, they became more interested in that effect and used that same work to estimate atmospheric cooling of the potential future CO2 decrease because they were worried if we were gonna have another ice age or not at that time, long time ago. So as I mentioned, Arrhenius also calculated the doubling of, of CO2 uh, that would cause global warming. And so that was a very early prediction in the, in the 1800s. And so um, he, he also took into account uh, that about water vapor, but determined that, uh, that we could have warming if we doubled CO2 in the atmosphere. So this was quite a long time ago. And it was in the news. It was in the news in the early part of last century, early, early parts in these two news, news articles. And of course, it's been in the news, but most importantly, since 1988, that I'll speak about in a minute. So James, James Hansen, who was the head of NASA Goddard Lab, uh, testified the U.S. Congress in 1988 and basically making the case that we were warming our planet and we had to do something about it. And people were listening. And he used some of the data from his modeling to forecast how warm we would get. And as you can see from this red dot, he was pretty close in what we, where, where we would be by 2010 and even now by, by, by 2020. So he had it right, even back then. 
Meanwhile, Charles Keeling, also, uh, he was a chemist who started, who actually devised a, a device to measure atmospheric CO2. And so he started measuring carbon dioxide and noticed that it changed seasonally. As we know, it changes seasonally because of, there's a lot of uh, vegetation in the Northern Hemisphere. So it, you're, you're actually pulling out CO2 at that time when there's growth, and then it's less, less when it, during, the, during the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere. But then he started to see that those jaggedy up and down seasonal variations are actually on a very, very steep increase over time. And that is because of the increase in those greenhouse gases that I mentioned, the ones that vibrate and capture heat. And this is, a, this is the latest plot from the Keeling curve. This is measurements from, from Hawaii. It's, it's run by Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And that's how we know that there's CO2 increasing in the atmosphere. So let me talk about climate forcing. What causes it to change? astronomical cycles, volcanic events, tectonics, and of course, us. And so let me turn it over to Louisa for a menti moment. We, we want to ask all of you if you know this, although it's a tricky question, let's see. During which season is the Earth closest to the sun in the northern atmosphere? Hemisphere. Hemisphere, sorry. Um, let's see. Okay. Winter and summer so far. So remember that you can uh, participate using uh, the Mentimeter code 967445. And I see a lot of you got that right. Great. OK, so I think we have a clear uh, average between winter and summer. What do you yes. think of that, Kate? Well, I think that it's a tricky question because uh, you'd think if, if the Earth is closest uh, to the to the sun, it would be it would be the summertime. But in fact, it's the winter time, and it's because of the fact it's not really the the distance; it's really the angle of the of the of the Earth, whether it's facing towards or away from the sun, that causes the the the, the, the warmth or cooling in the atmosphere. So let me t talk to you about why that is and why we know about it from the past. Next slide. So Milankovitch was an astronomer and he calculated Earth's uh, orbital shapes and frequencies and they change how much solar radiation comes into the Earth. And it's been proven to be stable for millions of years in terms of these changes in the orbital, what's called the orbital parameters. Next slide, I'll show you a picture of it. So these are called Milankovitch cycles and there's three parts to it. There's how the, the elliptical, uh, uh, pathway changes, get, goes longer or short or, or rounder, if you will, and how the tilt of the earth changes, very small amount, but it tilts. And so as, as, I did, as that, that question you just answered uh, showed, it's really that tilt's very important. And then it's, it's how, and what direction is that axis moving in, which is called precession. And so these change over predictable time periods, 100,000 years for electric, uh, eccentricity, 40,000 years for, for the about for the tilt in the, around 20,000 years of precession. And so these, because they're changing, they're changing solar input to the Earth and changing our climate. Next slide. So this is a very busy slide, and it's, it's showing you on the, from now back to, uh, to a thousand, thousand years ago. And it's showing uh, that there's variations in the parameters of precession of liquid and electricity, uh, eccentricity. So what you can see here, I just want to take that busyness out, all those changes in the parameters changes the variation in how much solar energy comes to the Earth. What you can see is when there's low solar energy, you actually get an ice age, it's cold. And, and when, it, when it's high, you get, uh, you're in interglacial. So that's how we know from the sediment records that you see, there's one exposed here in the mountains on the right, have, I'll explain in a minute, have fossils in them that can tell when it was hot or cold in the past. And because of that, we know that Milankovitch was right about all of those cycles. So we'll talk about volcanic eruptions. It's a beautiful picture. That picture was of, of Pinatubo. And what you can see here is a volcanic eruption put, put particles in the atmosphere that helped reflect energy. And so that then causes temporary cooling of the planet. So you can see in this slide, it's going from the last century to, to closer today, and you can see that there's, there's decreases in the, in the temperature on the planet, isn't that cooling? And then of course there's tectonics. And we call it, mountain building is called orogeny. And if 
you'll, you'll see mountain uplift that cause ma mass wasting and, and erosion of those mountains that causes rock fragmentation and that causes weathering. And weathering actually is a reaction that removes CO2 from the atmosphere and it causes the planet to cool, but it takes a long, long, long time. So for example, the Himalaya uplift cause cooling, but over, over many, many, many millions of years. And so of course the biggest forcing we are experiencing now is us. And this is just showing you uh, how much of, of the things we do cause carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So for example, transportation, electricity and heating our homes, other kind of burning that happens, industrial uh, activities cause 85% of the carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere. And agricultural and other activities you know, increase the methane. So we are really forcing the climate in a major way, more than uh, perhaps in any other natural forcing that we know about on Earth. So let me tell you about how I've learned more about this through that expedition that Louisa introduced me on, which was uh, an Arctic uh, expedition. And I'll stop here to let Louisa have a menti moment. So now let's see um, if you all know what uh, paleoclimatology is. So you can go ahead right now and answer the question. Um, you can, once again, just put on your browser www.menti.com and use the code 967445. Okay, ooh. Okay, so, so far, okay, two answers so far. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, I see we have big tendency here. Um, what do you think, Kate? I think I already gave away the answer. So that's <laughs> correct. It's really the study of past climates. I mean, we use tools like fossils and, and trying to use uh, our, our understanding of, of past climates to, to learn about how we can optimally live on the planet. But it really is the study of past climates. So oh, uh, let me talk about paleo, paleoclimate geology. We can extract the past climate by using proxies. So tree rings, when the rings are wider, it means that the temperature was warmer and wetter. When they're thinner, they were drier and cooler. So you can reconstruct uh, temperature from, from uh, tree rings and corals and some other, other proxy measurements. Ice cores from uh, Greenland, particularly in Antarctica, they captured the atmosphere of the planet at the time that the, uh, that the snow formed on these glaciers. So by coring it and then analyzing those gases, you can tell what the past uh, greenhouse gas concentrations were in, in, on the planet. And that, that goes back over 800,000 years. So tree rings is only a few thousand. Ice cores go back at least 800,000 years. And then sediment cores from the bottom of the ocean capture fossils that have a record of climate in them and they can go back hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So we can put all these pieces together to stretch back in time to reconstruct the past climate. So these are just an image of some of the fossils. So these fossils, these particular ones form shells, calcareous shells when they're living. And when they die, some of them live on the surface of the water, some of them live deep in the ocean. When they die, they capture an essence of the atmosphere, a ratio of oxygen isotope that varies depending on the temperature of the planet, for example. And then they fall to the sediment and are captured. And when we reconstruct that, that, uh, that, that when we recover that core record, sediment core record, we can then reconstruct climate. So this is a so these are two very detailed plots. And so on, on the, the, the one that says time, millions of years, um, it's going back over 65 million years. So the top of the plot is now, and it's going back 65 million years. And what the graph is showing you is a reconstruction, reconstruction from a scientist, um, Jim Zakos and others, uh, using those fossils and the measurements in those fossils to reconstruct the temperature temperature on the planet, average temperature from a whole lot of sediment cores from the bottom of the ocean. Now, what you see is that there's been long-term trends of variations in temperature. I'm going to show you this plot again later, but it's go on, the, on the right it's hot, on the left it's cold, and so you can see now we're kind of in what we, something we call a relatively cold period from, from in contrast to the past, but if you just blow up that upper um, five and a half um, 5.5 5 million years, you can actually see that we began starting glacial cycles that I had explained to you earlier um, 
at, at, at about two and a half to three million years ago. So that's when that, that, uh, the, the astronomical forcing tripped us into, a, into a glacial cycles, in and out of glaciers. Now, if you took 100 parts per million CO2 out of the atmosphere, like they, you do during interglacials, you could form a giant thick ice sheet that had been right here in Canada, thick ice sheets on, 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 our, on our land mass. Next slide. So that tells you a lot. It tells you that CO2, putting more in or out, is really the dial that changes the temperature on the planet. It's as simple as that. It's a, almost a direct relationship. So I'll turn it over to Louisa for the next Menti moment. Very, very interesting so far. So uh, let's see now. What can you tell us about if you had a chance to visit the North Pole, how would you get there? So you can simply um, enter, uh, let's say, for example, uh, by car, if you feel like going by car or uh, any other way. Okay, oh. very interesting. Dog sled, submarine. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I would swim. Good luck. <laughs> um, boat in 20 years. I think someone has a plan. Icebreaker, <laughs> sailing boat, the frame. Uh, okay, it's got a lot of kayak, maybe. Orca Ooh. trolley. Interesting. Teleportation, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Charter flight. I would bike. Okay. Very, very ambitious. Um, so what can you tell us, Kate, about a few of these methods to get to the North Pole? Well, almost all of them will work. I don't know about teleportation. That sounds very magical. <laughs> but um, most of them would work depending on the season. So in the winter, you could walk because it's frozen. It is still frozen in the winter. But it's getting less and less solidly frozen in the summer. So walking or using any kind of... Uh, vehicle on the ice, it would be difficult. It's great that, that everyone knows that the Arctic is an ocean. That's great, because <laughs> some people don't, don't realize that. But that's all, those are all terrific answers. OK, great. So uh, I'll, this is a, 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 a bathymetric chart of the Arctic Ocean. And you can see there's a ridge in the middle of it called the Lomonosov Ridge. And so that expedition I talked about, we went there uh, quite a long time ago now. and had three, three ships that I'll show you in a moment to actually recover a paleoclimate record from the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Next slide. And so this is an acoustic image of that ridge. And you can see there's, there's like a layer cake on top. And that's the sediment. We know that from acoustic imaging of the seafloor. So that's a cross section of the ridge. And that is a, a layer cake on the top. And the, our goal was to try to recover that sediment record in the middle of the Arctic Ocean where there's a lot of ice. And so what we wanted to do, so you saw this before, and you can see in the past, the reconstruction of our past climate, that we had a greenhouse world quite a long time ago where there was no ice on the planet, and it switched to an ice house world where then we began to see ice on the planet. So our goal was to try to recover that record, but previous to our expedition, the records only went back 1.5 million years. So that's what our goal was, and we were successful. We also wanted to understand the PETM. Okay, so, there's an excursion, a warming event that's very important in the paleo record called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. I sometimes call it the big heat. It was a release of greenhouse gases from, a, a, from I, I don't have time to explain why, but they were, they were released. And it caused warming and mass extinction events. And we look at these as sometimes proxies of what possibly could be happening now. And so we had three ships uh, because we had to stay on location because the ice is moving and it could drive us off location. So at the top of the, of the image that you can see of the ice, that's the same as the background of my slide, is a Russian, Russian, oops, Russian icebreaker. The middle one that broke big ice into smaller pieces. Then there's a, a Swedish icebreaker that took those smaller pieces and made them like slush so that the, the, the one on the bottom, the drilling vessel could stay on location because we needed to stay there multiple days in a row to recover that sediment record. So it was a big challenge and we were able to do it. And so we recovered that record and it had a lot of publications from many of the scientists on board and they were showcased in. in. And I'll just, there were four wake up calls. So hit one button in the upper. So we're going again from now until the past 65 million years ago. We recovered sea ice in the, in the upper part of the record that demonstrated that the sea ice, the summer and winter sea ice in the Arctic Ocean has been around for 17 million years. It's a long time. 
it may be go going away in a short amount of time within the next 20 years, possibly in the summertime. We also discovered that there was earlier ice, earlier than that, that three million years I showed you earlier. So there's a lot of consequences to this. It means that the, there was a lot of uh, happening both at the North Pole and the South Pole at the same time. When Antarctica was freezing, we had early ice in the Arctic. We also uh, had a time period where the Arctic Ocean was fresh water. And it, we know that because we recovered what you see here, which is azola, which is duckweed. We have that in our gardens today. And duckweed absorbs a huge amount of CO2, dies and falls to the ocean floor. So we think it was the reaction to excess CO2 in the atmosphere from those warming events I talked to you about. And finally, we recovered the big heat, the Paleocene the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And based on the analysis, the, the chemistry analysis of some of the, the residue from that, from that sample, we were able to show, not me personally, but the scientists in the, who published this, that the PETM was 24 degrees C temperature, average temperature, at all, we're really very close to the North Pole, which, which to us was the beginning of us understanding that there's amplification, there's more warming at the poles during these gas, greenhouse ga gas events than other parts. And that's what we're seeing today. So we had an early indication of this from this paleo record. And so the other part of the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum event, in blue you'll see the rate at which the greenhouse gases were released during the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum or the big heat. And the red is how fast we're releasing greenhouse gases today. So what we're seeing is something more extreme even than that big extreme climate event that happened um, during the Paleocene East and Thermal Max 56 million years ago. So simply put, this is a quote from my previous boss when I was in Washington, DC. We basically have three choices, mitigate climate, adapt to the changes, or suffer. But we have to do some of all three. So the more mitigation we do, the better we are the less adaptation we have to do, and the less suffering. So mitigate, what do we do to mitigate? Well, here at Ocean Networks Canada, we're coordinating an international team to actually develop what's called a negative emission technology. Now this slide is showing you today, 2020, the greenhouse gases that we need to reduce our emissions in order to mitigate the climate. So we need to rapidly decrease our emissions, we all know that. But we also know now, because we've increased so many, we're also going to have to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere in addition to our rapid reduction of emissions. So that's what's called negative emission technologies. And don't get me wrong, we need to reduce emissions. There is no, ex negative emission technologies is no excuse for reducing our emissions. That's our number one goal. But we're going to have to develop technologies to pull CO2 to the atmosphere to keep the planet habitable for us. So that's our goal with a project called Solid Carbon. You can learn more about it at solidcarbon.ca. What we're trying to do is pull the technology developed in British Columbia with carbon engineering, capture CO2, um, and then uh, on, on a floating platform in the ocean, pump it through the water column, and inject it into the subsea floor in ocean basalt, ocean crust that's formed uh, in the ocean through another tectonic process. Now why basalt is important is because Icelandic scientists and, and, and engineers demonstrated that by pumping CO2 into basalt, ocean crust, it turned into rock in a very short amount of years, uh, several years. So it becomes a, what we call solid carbon, a rock solid solution for permanently removing CO2. So we're doing a death study right now. We're currently funded by the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions to actually look at these three research areas. What kind of platform will we have to build? How fast and rapidly would, we, would, would this happen in ocean basalt, in the ocean itself? And then what are the regulatory aspects and the social aspects of how we can move forward with this negative emission technology? There are other negative emission technologies, like for example, planting trees and blue carbon, but we need to have every tool in the toolbox in order for us to get to a place where we have a habitable climate. And what about adaptation? How do we deal with the, with the warming that's already in the atmosphere? So for those of you from British Columbia in 2013, 14, 15, I think those were the years, there was a warming, two degrees C warming in this, in this North Central uh, Pacific Ocean and scientists called it the blob. And it caused 
a huge amount of impact on North America because of the cha that change, that big change in the ocean temperature. And so we were able to measure this um, at Ocean Networks Canada, but first I'll show you the, the satellite data. Uh, on the left is 1997 and El Nino, those are cyclic, happen on a regular basis that warm the surface ocean. You'll see that the area uh, in, in the, in where the blob was, was a, an extreme event that's showing you here in July, 2015. What you can see here is at Ocean Networks Canada, we, we measure rate, we measure uh, real-time data in locations off of BC, some in the Arctic and now some on the East Coast, but most of our measurements are offshore British Columbia. And this is at a site that's close to shore. And what you're seeing during that warm blob event, we had almost a two degree sea warming in the coastal environment, which means it impacts things like aquaculture. So these are the kinds of uh, events that we're gonna have to adapt to. We also are going to have to adapt to uh, ocean acidification. So we need to be making these measurements so we can help aquaculture industry and how do we, we actually protect both the farmed animals in the ocean and the natural animals in the ocean. Suffering. There was a paper that just came out last week um, that scientists are now able to demonstrate that it's undeniable now that climate change is causing human injury to us. I mean, we had uh, we had evidence of it, but it wasn't documented in a peer-reviewed way in scientific literature. And here in British Columbia, we also know that we're going to have lo lots of impacts uh, from, from sea level rise and extreme water levels and saltwater intrusion. And those are things that will cause us to, to be suffering. They're already happening uh, in, um, in other parts of the eastern, uh, east coast of North America, where, where they're having to move homes and infrastructure inland because of the effects and the impacts of sea level rise. And that's what we have to adapt to. We have to have plans to adapt to what we already have in the atmosphere. So here's the takeaways from the presentation today. We've known about greenhouse gases a lot, greenhouse gas and their effect a long, for a long, 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 long time. And it's been documented many times by scientists over and over in a variety of different ways. There are several things that I've showed you that actually force or change the climate, but right now we're doing the largest forcing at the moment. We, we're the ones that are forcing the climate the most. From the Arctic paleoclimate record, it demonstrates that our human forcing is even faster than even some of the most extreme events that we've learned about in the paleo record. So again, we have three choices. We better get on them, but let's put a lot of effort into mitigation. Let's make sure we adapt to what we already know is gonna impact our societies so that we don't uh, so we cause the minimal amount of suffering. So some of the individual actions that you can take are just shown in, the, in, this, in this slide. And so I'm sure you all have looked at some of these things that you can do. But in addition to these actions, the most important thing you can do is educate others who, who you know, uh, who don't know as much as you do about climate change. You know, ex explain to them about what you know and what, what you can share with them. And also be sure to vote and vote for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Wow, Kate, this has been such an interesting talk. Um, thank you, thank you. So uh, I hope you all learned something today and you took much with you. Um, we're gonna have a Q&A in just two minutes, but for those that have to go now, uh, we would like for you to keep in touch with us. So you can use our website, www.oceannetworkscanada.ca, or you can also use our ocean data portal, as you can see on the screen, uh, but you can also stay through social media. So you can use, look at our YouTube. We have many, many videos there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, you can also email us uh, at learning at uh, Um Make sure that you keep in touch with us so you can see the upcoming fall series that we're going to have. And a uh, special thank you to our funders. Ocean Networks Canada is funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Government of Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Fisheries and Ocean Canada, Canary, the Government of British Columbia, the University of Victoria, and many more. So thank you and please stay for the Q&A. So um, the Q&A is really simple. We're gonna also use Mentimeter. So you can go to w.menti.com and use the following code. If by any, any means you don't, have, you don't wanna go by, to Mentimeter, then you can simply put your questions into Zoom chat and Tessa will um, read them up, uh, will input them into Mentimeter or I will read them up loud. So, um, 
another oh yes yeah, so we have someone from the audience that says check out our climate action on youtube so you can go ahead and click that if you want um also, uh, if, you, if you have to leave right now, please take two minutes to complete our short survey, which is available in the Zoom chat right now. So, uh, Kate, I think we have a very, um, very interesting and strong question. How is mm -hmm. climate change affecting you, Kate? Well, I'll just talk a bit, a little bit about some of my, I'm not, I'm the president and CEO now of Ocean Networks Canada, so I, I don't have the, the, the privilege of going out to sea and being in the Arctic, but, um, it, for sure, climate change, if I were continuing my Arctic research, um, the climate change is, at, is affecting the Arctic in, in tremendous ways. We're, we're having great loss of sea ice. We actually measure sea ice thickness um, at one of our sites at Ocean Networks Canada. And that's changing um, the way that scientists are able to study the Arctic Ocean. And so, for example, they can no longer rely on going out in the summertime and actually working on the ice because they, 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 it's, it can be dangerous. So that's affecting uh, Arctic scientists and other scientists uh, uh, who, are, who do research. In terms of my personal life, right now I live in Victoria and uh, Victoria has, doesn't, have too, has, doesn't have too many extreme events at the moment. But um, when I lived in Rhode Island, um, on the, uh, when I was there, climate change was impacting Rhode Island directly. That's, I mentioned in the talk, there are some historic homes on the southern shore of Rhode Island that had to be moved inland about a kilometer because of sea level encroachment and erosion along that coast. Wow, that's a very insightful answer. Thank you. We have someone uh, in the Zoom chat who's asking, um, is climate change due to the poles changing, which will eventually flip? Mm. No. Okay. Um, why was the climate so much hotter in the deep past during the green, greenhouse earth period? Yes. Well, it was because so um, our the planet has evolved over time in terms of the changes in the in the atmosphere. So that there is a re, um, uh, basically a reduction of what's our greenhouse gases over time. That was during those long periods of time, and it was on these long trends that that uh, that that you know slowly changed the planet's climate. Um, the the species adapted. Um, I should also say that uh, there are other kind of extreme events like meteorite impacts, like there was a really bad day 65 million years ago where a meteorite hit the earth and caused the you know, extinction of, of species and dinosaurs. Um, so that's why, it was just because of the greenhouse gases. And then when, it, when those, the CO2 greenhouse gases reduce slowly over time, then um, the, the glacier cycles kicked in. It was like a flip switch that they started to kick in, and then that's when the 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 um, the, the, the astronomical forcing caused glaciers to form and melt, and glaciers to form and melt. Okay, wow, very interesting. I did not know that. Um, how can we, as scientists, bridge the gap between what research tells us and governmental policy? That's a great question. Um, I can say that. Um, one of the best, one of the most important work that I've, um, I've had a, a really great career and I've been lucky to be in places, um, but um, participating in science policy is really critical. So I, when I was in Washington, D.C., I worked under the Obama administration's White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And policy really can change the world. It can force things like regulatory issues to come to light. And when scientists are involved in policy, you can possibly move that faster. So there's a, in Canada, there's an annual conference called the Can, uh, Canadian Science Policy Conference that happens in the fall. And it's really important to contribute to that uh, from a scientific perspective so that it can, policymakers go there and listen and, and it can help change things faster. We need to move the government faster than it's going right now, that's for sure. Yes, that's very true. Um, we'll go to a Zoom question that we have. Um, how are indigenous being affected by climate change? Quite a deep question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, um, like in Canada, many of the indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, 
live on the coast and have um, been making their living through harvesting and, and fishing on the coast. And so, as I mentioned with that blob, that impact, the blob warmed the ocean, caused less nutrients, means there was less food for salmon, then it impacts the food supply for coastal indigenous communities. It's also changing the coastline. So in, in uh, Tuktoyaktuk in the north, there's encroachment of sea level rise on the, on the communities themselves. In the northwest of Alaska, there's several communities, um, indigenous communities that have, to, have had to move because their coastline is eroding. And it's not eroding in a way that is intuitive. It's eroding because of the fact that ice is forming later in the fall and the storms come in. So previously the ice formed early and it protected, it was a protective coat on the, on the coastline. And this, when the storms came, the ice was there to protect it. Now the ice has come later and those storms are coming in. So it's these combinations of climate uh, that, that really no one would have forecasted and really have big impact. And so at Ocean Networks Canada, um, the Maya's team who is, is helping us with these presentations um, have, are working with uh, indigenous communities to understand, first of all, uh, what information do they need in order to plan their futures. And so we are really interested in those conversations because we need to bring indigenous knowledge together with our scientific knowledge to help these communities. And right now, most of it is to help adapt. Very, very uh, good answer. Thank you, Kate. Um, before we go to the next question, someone asked, can you repeat the name of the conference where politicians can learn about climate? The one you mentioned. Uh, oh, about policy. So it's, it's a Canadian, uh, Canadian Science Policy Conference. Uh, can we, I, I, we can I'll probably post it somewhere. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll sit. So this is about Canadian policymakers who come together with the scientific community to help um, push policy in the right direction. Okay, perfect. I will put it in the Zoom chat. And uh, just as a side note, I will send notes from this presentation. Um, we have a very interesting question from um, Abiyodun mm -hmm. who says, do you, do you do collaborative research at international level? If yes, how can, can one engage in this? Oh, yes. Uh, so at Ocean Networks Canada, we are, uh, we, have, we deliver data internationally to anyone in the world. So if you want to be, uh, just go to oceannetworks.ca and um, there's the first thing, to, if you're a scientist out there and want to work with us, um, you just have to go to our staff list at oceannetworks.ca and click on staff scientists. And it's our staff scientists are the interface between the scientific community and our operations. And for solid carbon, for example, that's a special project we're doing. So it's at solidcarbon.ca, that negative emission technology. We are open to any people who want to collaborate with us because we know that negative emission technologies is a big challenge, doable, but the more people we can have on the international stage working together, the faster we can actually make that happen. Thank you. Um, Tessa just posted more information on that question, so feel free to read it in the Zoom chat. So now we have an optimistic question. How can we stay optimistic as individuals when we see leaders internationally who are not taking climate change seriously? Yeah, it can, it can be a bummer, I know. <laughs> um, well, here's how I stay optimistic. Um, you know, I talked about the big heat, Paleocene, uh, Eocene thermal maximum. So that was a time when there were no people on the planet. And we're here now. And we're pretty, we're a pretty amazing species. I mean, we have done a lot of climate impact. Um, but I think we are at a, you know, we're at a turning point now. And there's so many people working on climate action. And yesterday, one of the big oil companies, BP, made a commitment to stop being an oil and gas company. And I read in the news, I hope this was correct, that at that meeting of the shareholders, when the CEO made that announcement, the shareholders stood up and applauded. 
even though in the short term they're going to lose money. Yes. So those are the kind of the things. So you got to look at those things on a regular basis to keep yourself optimistic because we are a pretty, in, 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 we have ingenuity as a species. Oh, very optimistic. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you for the wonderfully informative presentation. I've heard that climate change influences tropical cyclones. Can I ask about the process behind this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things uh, that's really interesting about hurricanes and tropical cyclones is that they're a mechanism for the planet to cool the surface of the ocean, right? So when a hurricane goes by, and you have, a, you have a satellite imagery of the temperature of the ocean, you'll see the hurricane going by and then the water is much cooler on the other side. So it's really heat that drives those cyclones. And so because the, the, the temperature of the ocean is warming, we're gonna see, uh, scientists I think say that um, what we're gonna see is bigger, more intense, maybe not more numbers, but more intense and that's, there's anecdotal evidence of that, you know, Hurricane Sandy, uh, all the tropical cyclones, cyclones in the Pacific recently. So uh, again, um, that's a place where we're gonna have to be sure to adapt, make sure our cities are, can, be, uh, can, can withstand the impacts of these, of these cyclones as they hit the coastline. Uh, we have to build back more resiliently to be, to be able to, um, to, 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 to be, to be able to protect ourselves from these, these impacts. Yes, um, somehow similar, we have a question in the Zoom chat. Um, detail more about the source of the blob. Is it old warmer water from ocean currents that has risen? No, I think that the answer now, Richard Dewey, I, is, is Richard speaking in two weeks? Uh, yes, in two weeks. Yes, yes, so Richard is an expert on the blob. But I will try to answer, and if I got it wrong, he'll correct me in two weeks. Um, but my understanding about the way the blob worked was that what happens in the, in the winter times in the Pacific Ocean is that there's storms that causes mixing. And so it, 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 if you have those storms, you don't get the warming surface of the ocean. And so there were very limited amounts of storms uh, that, uh, that caused that warming to occur. Now, some people actually think that this, the lack of storms was related to a reduction in sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. That's another, that's another presentation. But the, what's, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic and it can influence the overall weather patterns on the planet. But it was the reduction of storms that, didn't, that allowed the, 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 the warming of the surface ocean. Thanks, Kate. And uh, yes, so in two weeks, we'll have Richard, who will be discussing a lot about the blob. So uh, make sure that you subscribe, or sorry, that you register for that talk. Mm -hmm. um, so now we have another question. Canada is warming at twice the global rate of warming. Should Canada be considered disproportionately impact? So that's largely uh, because of, when I presented the paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, and we show that it was the average temperature in the Arctic Ocean was 24 degrees C uh, average. Um, modelers previously had, uh, had estimated that at that time, during the PTM, the surface temperature would have been 15 degrees. So we had a big difference based on our measurements, which means the Arctic and, and the, the, the poles are, are having, um, are, there's an amplification of, of warming at the poles. The rest of Canada is going to be, I mean, there's, there, I would guess that there's going to be um, less of an impact than in areas that are closer to the equator. Uh, just because of the fact that we are really a cold nation in general, and we will have, we may have, we may have less of an impact. I'm not an expert on that, but I would say the Arctic is gonna be impacted as I mentioned already more disproportionately, but most of the population of Canada lives, you know, within 200 kilometers of the U.S. border, so. Okay, um, okay, so more personal uh, question. What's your favorite backcountry ski area? Well, I, I loved uh, the, the, some of the backcountry areas. Just if you go, um, if you drive up on the Trans-Canada Rogers Pass and you just go out the back door of, of that 
motel, if it's still there, is some of the most spectacular backcountry skiing, right? Just right there. That's, I'd say that's one of my favorite spots. Oh, nice. Okay, so maybe an activity to do in the next few months. <laughs> yeah, well, in the winter. <laughs> yes, in the winter. Um, can you say a few more words about the next steps with the Solid Carbon Project? Which specific efforts are being um, spearheaded by ONC? So this is that right now we're funded by the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, and they're also a partner in this. Um, and we have three areas of research um, trying to understand what kind of, so the technology that, that is required to pull this negative emission technology together exists. So we have a, a Karen Crawford from the University of Victoria and an engineer is putting, is looking at all the different kind of configurations of these six, six, six technologies that could be put together to make, uh, make this basically a new industry. Uh, here at Ocean Networks Canada, I'm leading the team that is developing what's called uh, the plan for a demonstration project. So Ocean Networks Canada, we have real-time monitoring at a ideal, the most ideal uh, location on the planet to uh, test this in the ocean at a place called Cascadia Basin. So we're developing that plan to do a demonstration off our coast. And we're seeking funds to do that demonstration. We just submitted another proposal to the federal government to, to actually uh, fund that demonstration project. And then we're also participating in uh, the social science aspects of it, the regulatory aspects of it. We need to make sure that we, we're in parallel ensuring that we, f we follow all the regulatory legal um, efforts. And with the business school here, we're partnering that with them to understand better investor acceptance. And so one of the things, if you go to uh, Swiss Re, Swiss Re is one of the biggest reinsurance companies in the world. And they um, are making a commitment to investing in negative emission technologies. And they have some wonderful videos on their site to explain why they are pushing uh, from a reinsurance perspective for industry to invest in negative emission technologies. So I think that, that that's, that's another optimistic <laughs> trend where we're seeing uh, the, the big industries of the world seeing that these investments have to be made. That's uh, very interesting. And I have to admit from my perspective, solid, uh, the solid carbon project in ONC, it's uh, quite innovative and I'm really impressed by it. So I'm looking forward. What are your views on Canada expanding trade through the Northwestern Passage? Is it a sustainable idea for the Arctic? Well, I think the Northwest Passage, um, so the, the Northeast Passage along the Russia coast is already being used for trade. It's gonna be, it's gonna be more accessible sooner. It already is in some ways. Um, I, I think it's inevitable that um, if there's a shorter route, um, then it's better for trade to go shorter. Uh, it, they release l less greenhouse gases. Um, so we have a question oh. from William in the Zoom chat. Um, Ken post the menti, no problem, William. Um, how does climate change affect the spread of infectious disease such as COVID-19? COVID. Yes, I think, um, one of, this is not my area, but I've read a little bit about it. And my understanding is that in addition to the climate, the climate is changing rapidly, but we're losing biodiversity in a major way. And I don't fully understand these links, but scientists who study biodiversity are suggesting that the loss of biodiversity makes the risks of infectious disease spread higher. So, I think I'd leave other experts to explain those details, but that's my understanding. And so uh, it's, I think Bill Gates um, may be the best expert on this in terms of, he's been warning about this for many years that we need as a species to be ready for the, the kind of uh, pandemic we're seeing right now. Yes, um, we'll go to a different question now. Okay, what is the relationship of ocean acidification to the to greenhouse uh, gas effects? Yeah, yeah so um, about a third of the CO2 emissions uh, that we've created as humans in the atmosphere have been absorbed by the ocean. 
and that's changed the chemistry of the ocean, making it more, it reacts, makes the, the ocean more acidic. So that's the link. And that's why we have to be able to understand that impact because it could, it could really negatively affect the, the whole ocean food web. But at Ocean Networks Canada, we're trying to work, we, we've installed through, I think uh, Joe gave a presentation uh, recently, we've installed a uh, real-time buoy in, um, in Bain Sound in British Columbia that's close to where there's big aqu aquaculture uh, and aquaculture industry, shellfish aquaculture industry. So we're, we were hoping to work with the shellfish aquaculture industry to see what kind of data they need about the measurements of ocean acidification to help their industry become and stay sustainable. So those are, that's, that's an example of adaptation because of that link between the absorption of CO2 and ocean acidification. Because ocean acidification, actually, you know those shells I showed you in the presentation, those calcareous shells, they can erode those shells. And so they can impact like baby, baby oysters and baby clams that, that can you know, die if they're, if they're yes. heavily impacted by acidification. Um, we have touched on that uh, a little bit in the previous talk. So for anyone in the audience, uh, you can visit our YouTube channel, but we'll also send it by email so you can look at the previous talks. Um, are there ways in which the effects of carbon pumping into the seafloor on bentos can be mitigated? On bentos can be mitigated. So um, we are, we will be looking at that. We're, we, we would be pumping carbon dioxide into the sub seafloor. So in the sub seafloor basalt, there are bacteria mm -hmm. in there. Um, we know that from other uh, scientific drilling expeditions, but the, there's, they're really not connected to this, the benthos, this, the life on the seafloor or in the water column. So in our demonstration project for solid carbon, we're going to include what's called a, um, a safe fail. We're going to try to fail, you know, cause some, some problem. Um, but, but, you know, in, in a controlled way to assess that risk of getting it into the seafloor. There's lots of reasons why pumping it into seafloor basalt is very safe because there's a sediment column above it. For petroleum geologists who study oil and gas, that's called a cap rock that seals the oil and gas. Mm -hmm. So we have a cap rock over the basalt and we would be monitoring the, the, any of the seafloor locations in real time uh, so that it could be, if there's any release, then it could be, uh, which, is, which would be highly unlikely, um, it could be mitigated. The other issue is that at those, these depths, um, CO2 forms hydrates. So they become, they, they turn into almost a solid. Okay. Um, thank you for that answer. Okay, we have a question about the IPCC. IPCC recommends about 50% reduction in carbon emissions in the next 10 years. What do you think will be the single most effective way to reduce emissions in this time frame? I think we should ban the internal combustion engine. Oh, okay. Can you give an example of that? You just ban it. You get a law that says by 2023, no more internal combustion engines will be allowed to be built, and the ones that are still on the road have to be off the road in two years. Okay, go Kate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, on what fields and skill set huh. does ONC draw to undertake its research and technological developments? Wow, we have, <laughs> we have all kinds of oceanographers, geological, biological, chemical, physical oceanographers. Um, we have software engineers. We have data stewards, so data scientists. We have marine technologists, marine engineers, ocean engineers. Um, who am I missing? We, ha that, that's a, we have almost every type of science and technology specialist there is. And together we, we, we really deliver 
our, our, our mission is to deliver high quality data. So you have to have the sensors and have the sensors working. So we need systems engineers, we need marine engineers, ocean engineers, and then all the sides of data. There's a huge area of data from software engineering to data scientists to help us to do all that work. Yes, Ocean Networks Canada has quite an extensive network of people. Yes. Um, with the current rate of warming, compared to the max you showed us, what are the implications for our future on Earth? Well, I think it's clear that we have to reduce emissions or else we, would be, we, we will be um, warming uh, the planet. So Earth will be fine. Mm -hmm. yes. It just it won't be habitable for our species. That's really the future if we don't drastically reduce emissions and begin to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if you go, I, I encourage you to go to look at, uh, at Swiss Re. They have a video on it that's really very clear. It's about four minutes long, I think. Okay, we'll, we'll try to find it and send it. Um, was the sun hotter in mm -hmm. ancient times? There's variations in the sun, but it's, I don't think it's, it's it ha, from my understanding, it hasn't been a, an impact on climate. Like the, the four areas that cause climate forcing is what I showed you. Any chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to work on that to make sure that it happens. Yes. Um, and for the last question, CO2 is a small percentage of atmosphere. Won't the carbon capture require a lot of energy and time to capture enough mm -hmm. CO2? Yeah, the energy, the part of it, it, the carbon engineering is a leading, one of the leading companies in the world that's working on this. So um, they ha they're, I think the time they've been, they've been reducing the time, but the energy uh, need, which means the cost really, and how do you get that energy is what they're, tr they're trying to reduce the cost. And they're optimistic they, they can do so. There's also a huge group of people, um, a, a maker community that's building, uh, they're building their own CO2 capture machines, like, you know, like, like MacGyver. So it's kind of cool. So there's, there's lots of people working on it. So I'm, I'm again, optimistic that we'll get there. So thank you, Kate, um, for your great answers. Thank you to all these participants for these great questions. Um, you really made this more uh, interactive by asking those questions. So thank you, Tessa, for the interactivity also. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really hope to see you in the future uh, webinar series in the fall, and hopefully in the last uh, talk of the summer webinar series. And just as a reminder, take two minutes to complete our satisfaction survey. We use that to improve this series and uh, give you more information. So uh, thank you all of you again for participating and we hope to see you soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>